everybody. You are welcome to the Easy Learning Platform. I'm glad and excited to have you join us for this tutorial, for this lesson. Today we'll be starting with the second lesson of the course, ME 164 Statics of Solid Mechanics. Today we'll be doing forces. We'll be doing forces. Now before we start with today's lesson, let's do a quick recap of the lesson one we did previously. And by the way, if you have not reviewed lesson one, go to our YouTube channel or Facebook channel and get the lesson to understand what we're doing today into details. Now, in our first lesson, we looked at what is mechanics. And we said that mechanics is the branch of physical science that deals with the study of body in motion or at rest. We also look at the subdivisions of mechanics and we said that there are three subdivisions of mechanics. Mechanics of deformation, mechanics of rigid body, and mechanics of fluid. We also look at some terminologies with respect to mechanics. We look at length, we look at time, used to specify the duration of an event. We look at mass, we look at the Newton laws of motion, the first law, the second law, the third law, of motion. We looked at the derived quantities and fundamental quantities. We looked at dimensional analysis, how to derive units and find units of any given quantities. And we also looked at how to convert units when it's given to you in kilogram or other preference, how to do the convention. Now today we'll be zooming straight into forces and I believe that you're going to have a wonderful time as we start this course. Forces. What is a force? A force represents the action of one body on another. A force represents the action of one body on another. There are three characteristics of force. A force is a vector quantity. Now, we have scalar quantity and vector quantity. A scalar quantity has magnitude but no direction. But a vector quantity has what? both magnitude and direction. Now, a force is a vector. So when you are looking at the characteristics of a force, you are looking at direction, you are looking at magnitude. A force has direction. A force has magnitude. And the last characteristic of a force is that a force has a line of action. These are the three characteristics of a force. Magnitude, direction, and a line of action. Those are the three characteristics of what? A force. Now when several forces act on a body or a group of bodies, it constitutes a system of forces or force system. Now when two or more forces act on a body, it forms a force system. So you have a one force here acting on this body, you have another force acting on this body, trying to lift the puppet, it's a force system. Two or more forces acting on the body becomes what? A system. A system of forces. What effect of force? A force causes a moving body to stop. It causes body to decelerate. A force causes body to accelerate. A car is able to accelerate because of the force generated by the engine. A force deforms a body. If I want to bring this whole studio down, when I bring a bulldozer, it applies a force to pull this body down. It deforms the body. A force, frictional force, helps us to move. Forces have great effect on our daily life. It's all about forces. If I want to pick this note from the platform, I need to apply a force. Without a force, I cannot pick this item. I cannot pick this notebook without what? A force. 
Now, when we say a force has magnitude, it means that if this is a block A and I want to move this block to the right, okay, to my right, I need to apply a certain force of a certain magnitude, let's say 50 Newton. So this 50 Newton tells me the magnitude of the force aboard, applying probably 100 Newton. So I cannot talk about force without mentioning the magnitude of the force I am what? Applying. Now, whenever you see a force diagram or you see force being applied on a body, you must also make reference to the direction. Because if I make the statement, I must go and apply a force on the block A. I've not said anything. What is magnitude of force? Even which direction do I want the block A to move? But when I ask, I'm a apply the force on block A for block A to move to the right. So that means that I'm a will know, okay, I need to apply the force this way for block A to move to what? To the right. So direction is very important when it comes to forces. Now, what is the line of action? Now, we watch football a lot. Imagine it's a penalty. Penalty, the goalkeeper is here, and Messi too is here, went to score. Now, if the keeper sees that Messi is going to kick the ball here, now, if I am the keeper and I see the line of action of the ball, that is the same line of action of the force because you have to what? strike the ball with the force. So the force is going to move the ball along this direction. So the ball will be here, will be here, will move there, will move here and enter into the net. So now this will be the line of action of the force. I am the striker. I want to put the ball here, at this side. So I kick the ball this way. Now, this will be the line of action of what? The force. So that is what? The line of action. So these are the three characteristics of the force. It has magnitude, direction, and the line of what? Action. Now, for a force system, we have classification of force system. We have collinear forces. These are forces that act on the same line. Collinear forces are forces acting on the same line. We have coplanar forces or parallel forces. They lie in the same plane. They are coplanar forces. And we have concurrent forces. Their line of action intersect at a common point. So for concurrent forces, they have a common point of intersection of the line of action. Classification of forces. Now, earlier, we looked at Collinear forces, coplanar forces, these are the diagram to explain. So for coplanar forces, okay, coplanar, collinear, you see, this is the XY plane, okay, forces acting on the same plane, but F1, F2, F3 are in the same line. So they are collinear, they are acting along the same line and they are in the same plane, XY plane. These are coplanar concurrent forces. They are all acting in the X and Y plane. F2 is also in the X and Y plane. F3 is in the X and Y plane. F4, X and Y plane. 
and they are concurrent. So we call it complainer concurrent forces. These are complainer concurrent collinear forces. You can see that F1 and F2 are acting on the same line. Their line of action also intersects and they are also acting in the same plane. C is complainer parallel forces. They are acting on the same plane, X and Y plane, but they are parallel to each other. They don't meet. They are not concurrent. They are not concurrent. Now D is complainer parallel forces. Complainer parallel forces. They are acting on the same plane and they are para forces. They are not concurrent. They don't meet. And this is non, he is non complainer concurrent forces. They don't act on the same plane, but they, they meet at a point. They have, their line of action intersect at a point, so they are non non complainer concurrent forces. And the last one, F, this diagram is an example of a non concurrent. Their line of action does not intersect. Look at F1. The line of action is in this direction. F2. The line of action is in this direction. F3. The line of action is in this direction. F3. F3. Line of action also in this direction. Their line of action does not intersect at what a common point. So they are non-concurrent and non-parallel forces. There is resultant of a system of concurrent complainer forces. We want to look at how to resolve a force system. How to find the resultant force of what? A system of concurrent complainer forces. We looked at what are concurrent forces. We know what are complainer forces. How do you find the resultant of such a system? The equivalent force, because we said that a system has what more than one force acting on the body. How do you find the resultant force or the equivalent force? The resultant force of a system of a force is the simplest equivalent force system to which the system can be reduced. The resultant of a system of forces is the simplest equivalent force system to which the system can be reduced. Forces obey the parallelogram law of vector addition. And this law can be used to find the resultant of a pair of concurrent forces. The parallelogram law of vector addition states that if two vectors P and Q are represented in magnitude and direction by straight lines O, A, and O, B, comma. Then, the resultant R is represented in magnitude and direction by the diagonal O, C of the parallelogram O, A, C, B. So, this is what we are trying to say that you have vector OB and vector OA and these are concurrent complainer system. Why are they complainer? They are acting in the same plane. Okay, so this is what? Complainer and concurrent means that this is the line of action of this one, this is the line of action of this vector and they intersect at point O. So it qualifies as what? A concurrent complainer system. Now it obeys the parallelogram law. And with the parallelogram law, we need to complete the parallelogram. So we draw a parallel line as OB. Okay? So we complete the parallelogram 
And one of the priorities of paragraph is that both sides are equal and opposite angles are also what? The same. These are properties of what? Parallelogram. So we complete the parallelogram there. So that is Q here and P also here. Then we have C as a point of what? Intersection of what? Q and P. Now we draw a straight line at the diagonal. Okay, OC. So OC represents the resultant of the force. Represent the resultant. Represent the resultant. Now vectorially, we have OA plus OB is equal to OC. OA plus OB is equal to what? OC. OA plus OB is equal to OC. Now what is OA? OA is speed. Okay? And OB, OB is Q because OB is the same as what? AC. OB is the same as AC. So we are saying that OA plus AC is the same as what? OC. So OA which is P plus AC which is Q is equal to what? OC. And that gives us what? OC which is what? The resultant. R. Resultant R. Now, for a parallelogram, opposite angles are what? The same. Opposite angles are the same. So if this is theta, then this also be theta. Okay? If this is theta, this is what? Theta. And for a parallelogram, angle on the same line will have to give you what? 180. So if this is theta, then this will be what? 180 minus theta. And because opposite angles should be the same, this will also be what? 180 minus what? Theta. So with the parallelogram law, it obeys the laws of vector addition. Okay? Vector addition. So it means that the forces must be given to you vectorially. Vectorially. Example, if I have F1 to be 2i plus 3j plus 4k, and F2 to be 6i plus 3j minus 2k, and I'm to find the resultant of these two forces acting on the body. This I'll give you vectorially. Then from the parallelogram law, my resultant force RF will be equal to what? F1 plus what? F2 vectorially. So I have 2i plus 3j plus 4k plus 6i plus 3j minus 2. Okay. I add them vectorially and adding them I have 8i when you are adding vectors you add vectors according to directions so the i together the j together the k together plus 6j plus 2k this gives me the resultant of the two forces vectorially. Now what about in the case where the forces are not given to you vectorially? You don't know the direction, but you only know 
the magnitude. How do you find the resultant force when you are given the magnitude? How do you find the resultant force? Example, let's say you, have, you only know the magnitude. F1 is 60 Newton, F2 is 80 Newton. And this is a coplanar concurrent force system. And you know that it obeys the program word law. You have to what? Complete the parallelogram. So let's complete the parallelogram. So this side and this side is the same. Let's say we know the angle to be 60 here. That means that we're going to have 180 minus 60. That will give us 120. This side will also be 120. This side will be 60. It means that our resultant force is going to be from here to this side, RF. Now, are we going to say that our resultant force, RF, is equal to 60 plus 60 Newton plus 80 Newton? No. Why? Because the forces are not given vectorially. We are given only in the magnitude. So you cannot tell me that the resultant force will give us 140 Newton. No, this is wrong. How do you solve such scenarios? Then we go to the sine rule and the cosine rule. So we're going to use the sine rule and the cosine rule. That's what we're treating this, the sine rule and the cosine rule. Now for the cosine and the sine law, you have a triangle, okay? You have a triangle and this represents the length the length, the length, or the magnitude, and the angles, okay? Now, if you want to find C, okay? If you want to find C, which is what? The magnitude. How do you find C? Okay? It's giving us square root of A squared plus B squared minus 2ab cos c okay cos c and the sine rule or the sine law to help you find the angles now if you want to find the angle the rule is simple a sine a is equal to b sine b which is equal to C sine C. That means that assuming I know this side and I know this side, I can find any of what the value represented there. So the sine rule or the sine law and the cosine law are going to help us to find the resultant force provided it's not given to us vectorially, but we only know the magnitude. Example number one. Two complainer forces with magnitude 96 Newton and 80 Newton act at point O. Determine the magnitude and direction with respect to the X axis of the resultant if the angle between the force is 120. If the angle between the force is 120. So I'm going to solve here. Solution. So we draw the diagram. 
180 Newton. The angle here is 120 degrees. This is moving this way 96 Newton. Now remember that we said that for concurrent complainer forces, it obeys the if we want to find the resultant force, we have to apply the parallelogram law. Now we have to complete the parallelogram. How do you complete the parallelogram? Remember that for parallelogram, opposite side are what? Equal. So we complete the parallelogram. The parallelogram. If this is 120, then this will be what? 60. That means that this side is also what? 60. It means that this angle is also what? 120. Don't forget, opposite angles are the same. Now we want to find the resultant here. So we call this RF, the resultant. How do we find the resultant? Now, from the previous slide, using the sine rule and the cosine rule, remember we have something like a triangle. This is A, B, C, and this is small A, and this is small C, and this is small B. Okay? So we want to form this in the same way as what a triangle. So now I can have this way. So this is 80 Newton, this is 60, now this is what, 96 Newton, this is RF I want to find, RF I want to find. So I don't know this angle. This is alpha, this is what? Beta. How do I find Rx? We said that from the cosine rule, Rf is equal to square root of this squared plus this squared minus this times minus 2 times this times this cos this. So we have 96 squared plus 80 squared minus 2 96 80 cos 60. What is Rf? When you do the mathematics you find Rf to be 89 89.084 Newton eighty nine point zero eight four Newton you can also solve this using a different approach where you maintain the 120 as the angle but instead of minus you use plus when you solve it that way it will also give you the same answer so you can use that approach where you want to use the angle given then you have to use plus instead of what minus now how do we find the angle with respect to the S axis. With respect to the S axis, we want to find 
the angle here, the alpha. We want to find the angle there, alpha. Okay. So we know this side. We know this side. We know this side. And we know only one angle, 60. So we're going to use this with respect to this using the side rule. So we have RF over sine 60 should be equal to 96 over sine alpha. We already know that RF is 89.084. So 89.084 all over sine 60 times, sorry, is equal to 96 over sine alpha. We make sine alpha the subject. So we have sine alpha is equal to sine 60 times 96 all over 89.084 so we find the sine inverse alpha is equal to sine inverse of sine 60 times 96 over 89.084 and we have our alpha to be 0 sorry 69 68.96 degrees don't forget this angle Okay, so we solve the second example. The screw I below is subjected to two forces, F1 and F2. Determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. Now you realize that this was a concurrent complainer force system. So as we did previously, using the parallelogram law, that is the same approach we're going to use and using the cosine and the sine laws. Don't forget. So, solution, we have the sketch of our problem on the board. We have to complete the program. We have to complete the program. And one of the interesting things about program is that both sides are equal and opposite angles are also the same. So we complete the program. This force is 150, F2 is 150, that means that F2 here is also equal to 150 Newton. F1, it means that F1 here is also equal to 100 Newton. 100 Newton. Both sides are the same. Now, what do we do next? We have to connect the diagonal. Now the diagonal represents our resultant force RF. Resultant force RF. Now we know this angle to be 15. We know this angle to be 10 degrees. It means that we can find the angle here. And we know that the angle, right angle triangle, this becomes the right angle, 90 degrees. So if this is 10 degrees, this is 15 degrees, what will be this angle? That will be 90 minus 25. And what is 90 minus 25? That will give us 65, right? 65. So this is 65 degrees. 65 degrees. 90 minus 25 will give us 65 degrees. Okay. So having known this angle, 65 degrees. Now what will be this angle? That will be 180 
180 minus 65 degrees. 180 minus 65 degrees. And what 180 minus 55 degrees give us? It's 115 degrees. Put it here, 115 degrees. Okay, so now I want to work with this triangle. So I represent this triangle this way so that I can now apply my sine rule and cosine rule. I can do it straight forward. But I want to break it down further for you to understand. So that is 115 degrees, 115 degrees. This is my RF. Now this will be my F2, that is 150 Newton. This side is F1, which is 100 Newton. 100 Newton. So using the cosine rule, using the cosine law, what do we have? I have RF to be called to square root of 100 squared plus 150 squared minus, don't forget, minus 2 100, 150, cos, uh -huh, cos what? 115, good. Cos 115. Don't forget your sine rule and your cosine rule. It's very important. It's very important for you to remember the sine rule and the cosine rule. Now, working further, what will be our RF? Our RF will be giving us 213 Newton. Okay, so punch it on your calculator. Input this value in your calculator. It will give you the exact value of RF. And you have RF to be 213 Newton. Now the person says that we should find the direction of the resultant force. So we found for the resultant force but what is the direction of the resultant force with respect to the s axis now it means that we are going to find for this angle theta from the resultant force to meet the s axis okay so this whole angle is theta now we know that t theta will be equal to alpha plus 15 degrees. Do we know alpha? We don't know alpha. Now, our alpha is the same as this angle here. This angle here from this diagram. So, this, this value will give us our alpha. It means that we can use what? The sine rule to find alpha. So, let's use sine rule to find alpha. So, using sine rule, using sine law we know that from this diagram okay rf213 over sine 115 is equal to 150 over sine alpha so we have sine alpha is equal to 150 times sine 115 all over 213. Alpha is equal to sine inverse of 150 times sine 115 all over 213. Alpha will be equal to 39.8 degrees. 39.8 degrees so this will give you the value of alpha now having found alpha what will be your theta okay what will be your theta our theta is equal to alpha plus 15 degrees so theta is equal to 
39.8 degrees plus 15 degrees and that will give us 54.8 degrees so that is theta thus the direction theta So this is your first assignment, assignment number one. What is the angle theta if the resultant force R of the two forces have a magnitude of 100 Newton? For this condition, what will be the angle beta between R and the horizontal? So you are going to find the angle beta between R which is the horizontal force and the horizontal. So you do it as an assignment and you send it to easy learning platform at gmail.com. This is another exercise. I will quickly guide you to solve this exercise. I'm not going to solve it, but you are solving it right now. So get a sheet of paper and start working the exercise in the next one minute. I'm just going to guide you now the two forces F1 and F2 are joined as shown determine the resultant force we are determining the resultant force or the equivalent force of this force system now note that this is what a concurrent complainer force system so the same approach we used to solve the first example the same approach we used to solve the second example the first step is that you have to complete the parallelogram. Complete the parallelogram. So in completing the parallelogram, okay, so you're going to have this way. So you have completed the parallelogram, then your diagonals, your diagonals, your diagonals, okay. Then after this, use you apply the sine rule and the cosine rule to find the resultant force. So this will be a resultant force RF. So try it. We will make a tutorial videos on all the assignments. So make sure that you follow up on the lessons and check up on our tutorial videos for the solutions of the assignment that have been given to you. So we move on to the next subtopic, which is resolution of forces into components. When a force is resolved into two components <coughs> along the X and Y axis, the components are called rectangular components. When you resolve a force into two components, the X and Y component, those components are called rectangular components. So you have a force F now this is the Y axis and this is the X axis now I want to resolve this force into rectangular component okay so that you can have FX and FY now FX why are the rectangular component of the force? The process of obtaining the rectangular component is called resolution of forces. So what is resolution of forces? Resolution of forces is basically the process or the method you use to obtain those rectangular components, the Fx and the Fy, and that is solution of forces. So we're going to learn how to resolve forces. The diagram on the board, we have a force F. Now this force is not in the x direction, neither is it in the y. 
this force definitely has two components. It has a component in the X and a component in the Y. Another force like this, moving along this, then this force is in the X. It has only X component, no Y component. Let's say I also have another force this way, moving in the Y. This force does not have any S component. The component of the force is only in the Y direction. But this force is moving diagonally. So this force will definitely have what? A component of it in the S and a component of it in the Y. Like this, you have the phone here. Let me draw the axis. This is the Y and this is the X. Now, as I'm moving to the top, what is happening? I am moving in the X because I've moved a distance away from the X. And I've also moved a distance away from the Y. So, it means that I have a component in the X and a component also in the Y. Now, we've been given the angle theta. Now, in the coordinates, we know that the angle here is what? 90 degrees. Okay? The angle there is 90 degrees. So, this is what? A right angle triangle. Now, because it's a right angle triangle, we can apply the Pythagoras theory. Okay? Pythagoras theory. Now, if you remember your Pythagoras theory from secondary school, you know that expression that we use, which is so, ka, and tua. So, ka, tua. Now, which side is your opposite side? Now, let's do a bit of Pythagoras theory. This is just a reminder. Now, you want to identify the opposite side. <clears throat> The opposite side is the side the angle is facing, <clears throat> or the side facing the angle. So which side is facing the angle? That is this side. So this is the opposite side. The hypotenuse is what? The longest side. That is the hypotenuse. And this side will give you what? Your adjacent. Adjacent side. Okay? I want to find my Fx, the component of the force in the x direction, which is what? Also the adjacent. So, and I know my hypotenuse, which is F. Okay? So, I know hypotenuse and I know I want to find adjacent. So, the relation I use is what? Ka so cos theta is equal to adjacent, which is Fx over hypotenuse, which is F. So making F, X the subject, I have F cos theta is equal to Fx. So this gives me the component of the force in the x direction the rectangular component of the force in the x direction what about the fy if you want to find the rectangular component of the force in the y direction you go through a similar approach now this will give you your fy okay this is the fy so how would you find fy Fy is the opposite side. So we're going to use the relation which is what? SWA. Okay, SWA. And SWA, which is sine theta, is equal to what? Opposite. So now our opposite becomes what? Fy. And our hypotenuse is still what? F. So our Fy is equal to F sine 
theta. And this gives us the vertical component of the force or the Fy of the rectangular component. So we found for the rectangular component of the force in the X and Y direction. Example number one on the resolution of forces. Three complainer forces of magnitude 80 Newton, 70 Newton, and 60 Newton act at the point O are shown. Determine the resultant of these forces. How do you determine the resultant of these forces? The first approach that we are going to use is that we are going to resolve each of the forces individually. We're going to resolve the force one by one. So I will take the 60 Newton force and resolve it into X and Y component. I will take the 50 Newton and I will resolve it in X and Y component. This is already in the X. It doesn't have a Y component. Now after doing the individual resolution, what next? The next step is that I have to sum all the forces according to the component. What I mean is that I'm going to sum all the forces in the X direction together. I will sum all the forces in the Y direction together. After summing the forces together, then I can find the resultant force. Now, I want to resolve the 60 Newton force. So how would I resolve it? Solution. Let me use a black pen. I want to resolve the 60 Newton force. So I redraw the diagram here. Taking note of the angle. This angle is 60 degrees. This angle is 120 degrees. This is 80 Newton. This is 60 Newton. And this is 50 Newton. Now we know that angle on a straight line sum up to 180. Line to this point is 120. It means that this angle will be what? 180 minus what? 120. That will give me 60 degrees. So this angle is 60 degrees. Now, I can resolve this. Please, very important. When you are doing force resolution, force is a vector. A vector has magnitude and direction. So the direction is very important. You should learn how to give accurate direction to the forces. Now, this force, the direction of this force is moving upwards. That means that vectorially, I want to use this as my origin. And I want to meet this force at this point. Which path will I travel? I will travel through this path and that path. So my direction will be this way and that way. Your direction must be on point. Exact direction. When you interchange the direction, you have messed up the work. So please, your direction is very important. I repeat and I emphasize again, your direction is very important. Now, having indicated my direction, now I apply the Pythagoras Theorem principle using Sokatua. Now this is 90 degrees, right angle triangle. So I can apply what Pythagoras theory. Now this becomes my opposite side. We said that the opposite side is the side facing the angle, and that is sine swap. And sine theta is opposite over what hypotenuse. So I know that my hypotenuse is the 60. Newton. So I know that this will be what? 60 sine 60. Forces in the X. Now this is my adjacent. 
This side is my other cell side. Now, on the other cell side, of the relation would I use? That is what? Cos, which is cap. And cap is what? Adjacent over hypotenuse. So this one, I have 60 cos 60. 60 cos 60. 60 cos 60. And I finished resolving the 60 Newton force. I'm not done now. This is another force, a force of what? 50 Newton. That's the magnitude of what? The force. I need to resolve this force in the S and Y component. What would I do? I have to complete a right angle triangle. So I have this. Your direction again. Now, this is my origin, the direction of the force. Imagine I'm traveling along the Cartesian. Okay, Cartesian, X and Y axis. It means that I'm going to move this distance in the X and I'll move this direction in the Y. So, accounting for my direction, I move this in the X and I move upward in the Y. Now, this angle is 60 degrees. This angle is also facing this side. So this side is what? The opposite side. So this becomes 50 side 60. And this side becomes 50 cos 60. Now, as for the 80 Newton, it only has what? One component. Only in the S. It's not in the Y. Okay? It's not in the Y. It's only in the S. Only in the S. Next step. After the resolution, what I do is that I sum forces together. So I'm going to sum force in the S component first. Okay? So I have sigma Fx. Then you indicate your direction that all the forces moving in this direction is positive. It means that the rest of the force that moves in this direction becomes what? Negative. That is why I said that your direction is very important. Okay? So, from the diagram, which of the forces are moving in the X direction? We have 60 or 60. It's in the X. Yeah, it's in the X. Is it positive or negative? It's negative. Why? It's opposite to this direction. This direction is moving this way and it's also moving that way. So it's negative. So I have a negative 60 cos 60. Are you with me? Now, with the 80 Newton, it's also moving this way in the X. Is it positive or negative? It's positive. Why? Because the direction is the same as this. So we have plus 80 Newton. I can't forget about the Newton for now. Then, this 50 cos 60 is also in the X. Is it positive or negative? It's positive. Plus 50 cos So when you do the analysis, when you add them together, you have sigma Fx to be 75 Newton. 75 Newton. We go through the same approach for the sigma Fy. The same approach for sigma Fy. We go through the same approach for sigma F. Y. So sigma Fy now moving upwards becomes positive. It means that whenever you come down, the value is what? Negative. What do we have? We have this is moving upward, isn't it? This is also moving upward, isn't it? That means that this is in the Y. 
this one also is also what in our eye. So we have 60 sine 60 positive because it's moving upward, and this value is also positive. So plus 50 sine 60. When you add them together, you get 95. Point twenty six Newton. Please punch it on your calculator. Work it out as I'm working it on the board. You have ninety five point twenty six Newton. So we found for the sigma fx and for the sigma fy. Now the next step is to use sigma fx and sigma fy to find the resultant force now let me explain the formula we're going to use now sigma fx this is the summation of all the forces in the x direction so that means that sigma fx will be in the s direction so this is sigma fx and sigma fy represent all the forces, summation of all the forces in the y direction. So definitely sigma fy will definitely be in the y. So we try to plot this giving magnitude on the x and y direction. On the Cartesian, x and y Cartesian plane. So we plot them. So we had sigma fx to be 79. Sorry, 75, 75 Newton. And sigma Fy to be 95.26 Newton. Now from Pythagoras theory, we know that this is the hypotenuse. This is the adjacent. This is the opposite side. Now, Rf will be equal to what? Sigma F S squared plus Sigma F Y squared. So for us to find the resultant, we need to find these values. We've already found them, so we just have to what? Substitute into them. 75 squared plus 95.26. What is RF? Our RF will be equal to 121.24 Newton. So this gives us the value of RF. 121.24 Newton. That gives us the value of RF. Now, assuming in the problem they ask you to find the direction of the resultant force, how would you find the direction of the resultant force? Using the same problem, how do you find the direction of the resultant force? Now, this angle theta will give us the direction of the resultant force. It means that if you want to find theta, theta will be equal to this is opposite. And this is adjacent. So we're going to use tan. So tan theta will be called toward opposite. So katua. Opposite over adjacent. That is sigma fy over sigma fx. So you're going to have theta will be tan inverse of 95.26 Newton over 75. Newton. And that will give us 51.8 degrees. So this gives us the direction of the horizontal force with respect to the horizontal axis. Very simple. You need to know how to resolve the forces. Like the question we did, we had to resolve all the forces individually. When we finished, we sum the forces 
according to direction. We sound forces in the X together and we sound forces in the Y together. And when we finished, we found the magnitude, which is square root of sigma f squared plus sigma f y squared. And after that, we have to find the direction using the relation tan theta is equal to sigma y over sigma s. Simple as that. You'll be able to solve any problem on resolution of forces.